So it is uh, 1045 on March 29th, uh, 2010, and this is the Collar Lab Convention uh, in Niagara Falls, New York. And uh, this session is titled Sussing the Floor. Uh, I'm your moderator, Barry Clasper, and uh, my uh, co-panelists are Deborah Carroll Jones down at the end and Mr. Ed Foote here sitting beneath me. <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> And uh, just to kick this off, first I'd like to say that um, I did not, contrary to rumor, invent the word sussing. It's a perfectly good English word. Uh, you can find it in even the Webster's Dictionary. Um, it, it turns out that when I, I, I originally proposed this topic, actually, as a title of a series of newsletter articles, uh, and both Deborah and I wrote uh, editions of that series, and... Um, that was the word that sort of popped out of my mouth when I proposed the, the idea for this session, a series of articles. And it turns out that it's a word that's very commonly used in the UK, um, fairly commonly used in Canada, and is completely unknown in the US. So I got all these weird things. What do you mean by sussing? What the hell is this sussing thing? So sussing is just a, a word that basically means to investigate or to figure out, uh, to, to try and you know, get the lay of the land. So as we apply it to our square dance choreography, the idea is that you show up on a dance floor um, and you've got some dancers standing in front of you. How do you decide what kind of choreography you can use with those dancers and what kind of a presentation you can give those dancers that they're going to find entertaining and that they're going to find just challenging enough but not too challenging? Um, what is it that those dancers are looking for? So that's really what we mean by this term sussing in the context of, um, of square dancing. And uh, it's something that most callers, after, especially after you've been calling for a while, you're aware that you do it, but you're not necessarily sure how you do it. Um, and I became very aware of that. The, the, the thing that sparked the idea for this in my mind was the very first Caller Lab convention that I went to. I was sitting in the bar. That never happens at Caller Lab conventions. And uh, I was kind of sitting next to a group of callers who were, you know, talking things over. And these were, among these callers, were some of the icons in the field, you know, people that I looked to in awe. And they were saying how, yeah, we do this thing of trying to figure out what the dancers are going to be able to do for us, but they weren't really sure how. Uh, they, they couldn't articulate any techniques that they used um, or, or, you know, any methods that helped them do it. And, you know, this first step, second step, third step, and it's all figured out kind of thing. Um, and then they just kept ranking and it disintegrated from there. Uh, but that percolated in my mind. It sort of got me thinking about it. And uh, I realized that it is something that we do. And we, it's not something that's taught at caller schools, for instance. I never heard any topics like that at a caller school uh, explaining how you would go about doing this thing. So that's where this session came from. Um, we've, we're trying to get a number of different panelists uh, to speak on it because since it is something that we don't really have a lot of um, academic theory around, <laughs> Uh, everybody comes at it in a little different way and has different thoughts about it. So uh, we're just trying to sort of give you our takes on the way that we do it. And uh, later on, hopefully, we'll have enough time that uh, we'll be able to uh, get some some stories from you folks in the audience as well. So with uh, no further ado, um, that mic's down there, but it's not connected to anything. So <laughs> so I can either plug you in and, un and unplug this one, or I can just stretch this across Ed. <laughs> or I could let Ed go first. So let's do that. Uh, so our, our first speaker is Mr. Ed Foote, uh, who I'm sure you all know. Um, Ed was my uh, predecessor as chairman of the Challenge Committee, and he said a lot of gracious things about me, which I wish I could return. But uh, <laughs> Ed, is, Ed is one of the... Uh, Ed is one of the uh, icons in our field. He wasn't one of the icons that were uh, at that drunken meeting that I just told you about. <laughs> but... Uh, he, he's certainly one of the great contributors to our activity. Mr. Ed Foote. Thank you. I have to say one of the greatest decisions I have ever made in my life was the decision to turn the leadership of the Challenge Committee over to Barry, who has just done a superb job on it. How do we, how do we determine uh, what we're going to call to the floor? A lot of callers, when you, when you bring this topic up, they say, well, I, I have these combinations of calls, and I'll call these things and see how the floor reacts. And that's fine. That's, that's good. I do a little of that myself. But generally, when I start off calling, <coughs> I ask myself two things. First of all, how good do the dancers look doing the calls that they think they know well? 
Not all pass through, wheel and deal, double pass through, nothing. But I want to see how good they look. Do they look precise and sharp? Or are they kind of sloppy and they're getting through it just because they heard it a thousand times, but the, they don't look that good? That's the key in my mind. And I start right off in the um, <clears throat> first 60 seconds doing that. And the second thing I want to know is, are these dancers trained to take hands? Because that's the key to getting through material. So I'm just watching them. And I'm calling material that they can get through without taking hands because it's simple enough. But I want to see how well trained they are. Are they trained to take hands? If they are, then down the road I'm probably going to be able to call some more interesting material because they'll get through because they'll be able to recognize the formations they're in. But if they don't take hands, if they're just kind of wandering around, then I know i got to watch it because anything I call that's a little different, they're going to lose it because they're not used to reaching out and taking hands. The second thing I want to know is, are these dancers trained to listen? For me, it is vital that dancers listen. If dancers know nothing, but they listen well, I can get them to do a whole bunch of stuff. But if they don't listen, I can't get them to do anything. I just have to go through calling the same memorized patterns that they've had because anything that I say that's a little different, they either don't hear it because they've never heard it before, or they say, I heard him say it, but I don't believe it. So therefore, I won't do it. So I want to know how well the dancers listen. And I have a few little tests that I do that tell me how well the dancers listen. So in the first singing call, I'll start off and say circle right. Now, not that many people call circle right, or if they do, they call late in the dance. I want to hear if the people pick it up. Half the floor often doesn't even pick it up. Maybe three-fourths of the floor, depends on who I'm calling for. But often, they won't pick up that circle right. So then the next time, I'll say it a little louder and push it. And finally, they, they hear the circle right. I'll do something like um, Alamin left Alamo style and everybody circle clockwise. Now, that's nothing. It's sort of, sort of a humorous thing. But what this conveys to the dancers is we should listen to this caller because he's calling some things that are not difficult, but we haven't heard this from the average caller that we hear all the time. And that's what I want. I want them to say to themselves, I need to listen to this caller. Because if they're listening, I can get them to do a whole bunch of stuff. A third thing I do that's, again, and none of this is designed to break them down. It's just showing me how well they do it from a starting double pass-through position. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll call uh, girls walk, boys dodge. Do they do that well? Or are the people all flopping around like fish out of water? Uh, if they do it well, I say, okay. Good, I can, I can build on that in the future. I can do other things. If they don't do it well, if they don't believe I've even said it, if they're shocked out of their minds that somebody would dare say such a thing they've never heard before, then I know I can't really do much the rest of the evening. The whole, the whole objective here is uh, that the dance, to get the dancers to realize that they must listen. I want them to listen, and I want to convey that image early. And if they show me that they're not listening... And if I do these couple things and they still show they aren't listening, then I just have to back off and call nothing the whole night. And they're happy, and I'm happy because they're happy and everybody's happy. There are, in terms of material and in testing the floor for material, I want to call things that they won't break down on. And I want to see how well they do something that they won't break down on, but if they don't know it well, they'll look ragged. They'll look ragged, but they won't break down. The key for me is from parallel waves, with the boys in the middle, all eight circulate. Can they do that or not? If they can all do that, i got a good floor. If half the floor, the boys are the boy looking out, especially if he takes off running to the right or whatever, then I know um, um, i got to watch it. Another thing I like to do, I want to know how well do the dancers know what they're doing. So I'll put them in columns, and I'll call scoot back. Not triple scoot. I'll call scoot back. And I look, do the very two center dancers also trade? In other words, do they, does the floor do a triple scoot instead of a scoot back? If the whole floor does a triple scoot, I know, yeah, they're just, they haven't thought about definitions much and, and fine. Of course, it doesn't make any difference if they do a triple scoot. We know it equals the same thing as a scoot back. So that's a little test for me to see how alert they are. If not many of the floor get it, but a few people do the triple, uh, do the scoot back correctly so the very center two don't trade, Boy, I'm going to remember those dancers the whole night. I'm going to remember their faces because I'm going to use them later on 
for my key squares because I know they're the better dancers. And a third thing I'll do is I'll do a mixed sex scoot back. And I won't throw them into um, normal ways, boys and man, girls. We don't say scoot back and, and let them flounder if they don't get it. I'll help the people that need help because I'll say uh, scoot back, boys play with the girl in the middle. And they all laugh at that, haha. But it gets them through it. They don't break down. But I want to see how sharp they look. How sharp do they look doing a mixed sex scoot back? If they look sharp, well, I've got a fairly good floor here. If they don't look sharp and are just kind of staggering around, then I don't have a very uh, a very average floor. <laughs> so those are the things I do initially um, to determine uh, to determine the ability of the floor when I first start out calling. And there's the old rule of thumb, and I think most of you probably know this. You better know the level of your floor. The abil- you better know the ability of your floor by no later than halfway through the second tip. Better if you got it in the first tip, but no later than halfway through the second tip. Okay. Um, which is <coughs> any sense to anybody? There's a kind of a counter lever activity action going on right now. Everybody we could fully understand the inward and upward here. because you can okay. the logic of that is that as you squeeze inward, yeah. the air goes up. Yeah, I'm going to have to end it soon. Okay. You just want to pass it on. Am I clutch? Great. I have a handout. I, I ran off 25. I was, I, I'm excited to think that maybe we'll have, uh, have some left if I can just kind of start it on each side of the room. I thought that the title of this session, when I was first asked to do it, because I just got an email about it, that the word was shushing. I really did. So I had to get a little bit of correction on, on what that is all about. I'd never heard the word. No. <laughs> and I'd never heard that word before. But <clears throat> when I first began calling, I had three goals as a caller. And uh, one was to have fun. Number two was to be accepted as a good caller, not a good female caller. I wanted to transcend the gender. And third, I wanted to be able to read a floor and provide for them what they were there for that night. I wanted to be able to do it no later than two-thirds of the way through the first tip. So doing a panel like this where I hear what guys like Ed Foote that call all through the challenge level, which I do not call, and I want to know how does he figure it out. That to me was magic when I would go and, and dance to a caller and they would provide this wonderful dance that had the, the hot shots hooping and hollering, and yet those folks that were needed a little kinder, gentler sort of a dance were still pleased as well. For me, sussing a floor, reading a floor, is emotional as well as choreographical. Because I have found if they're in a good mood, if they're happy, they'll do things for me that if they're in a crabby mood, they won't do choreographically. I can't get them to trust me enough to, to let, uh, for them to let me lead them through certain things. So as you see by the handout, I think it starts before the dance. I like to get there and see what the attitude is of the folks that are putting on the dance. Are they not in a very good frame of mind because they really didn't want to have to be in charge of this dance, but the president is out of town, so now we have to be the ones in charge? That makes a difference. I want to know what their attitude is. So I like to get there early enough to chat up the club officers a little bit. And then I like to watch the people coming in the door. Do they have a certain air of expectation about them? Uh, Are they coming in with a smile already on their face? Or are they coming in with an attitude of maybe they've had a hard work week and they're just kind of bent over with life stresses? That makes a difference for me because I want to get them to forget those problems and turn their spirits and their minds. I sound like some sort of cult leader. (laughs) I want them to turn that over to me and allow me to lead them into a fun experience. I also have found that I can find some of the best clues out there if I watch pre-rounds, if you have them at the dance that you're doing. Um, I came in to Buffalo this past weekend, and I did an afternoon dance and an evening dance. Now, I had, did not, had not called for those people. I did not know them in any regard. The dance was advertised as plus. 
What liar here has not gone into a dance advertised at a certain level and found out those people can't dance that level? So you have to, yeah, you have to ease your way in. And how do you do that without destroying their confidence? If their confidence gets destroyed, they won't do anything for you. And you can't patch it back together that night. I've... I bear the scars of entering into that kind of battle of poor judgment and coming in and, and dealing too, di- too difficult material right off the bat. So I found that who are those people that probably dance pretty well? And I look for the round answers, and I hadn't thought about it, Ed, until you said how they look when they're out there on the floor. Do they have a certain type of style? Are they holding their bodies in a certain way? Because long-time round dancers who have kind of learned how to do that are usually very long-time square dancers. You don't have too many round dancers that just come in off the street. You know, right? They came from our square dancers. So if they've been around for a while, that tells me I can usually count on them in my key square. That's what I'm looking for. Who's out there on that round dance floor? Um, If there has been a workshop before the dance, and we do that in Texas, not so much in California, not so much in other places. But in Texas, it's very common for the the pre-rounds to start at 7 and end at 7.30. The caller comes in and does a workshop from 7.30 to 8 o'clock, and then the dance starts. Well, if I've done a workshop, I have a much better idea of what they can handle. But in Buffalo, I came in cold. I, I watched the round dancers very carefully, but I'm not really sure what these guys can handle. So it was a, a shared dance with three other callers, and I've got my third of that first tip. Do you understand what I'm saying? I only have a short amount of it to try to figure this out very quickly. And then it was my turn to call. We changed off callers. <clears throat> Pardon me. And when I got through with the first tip, now I had never met Sydney before in my life, okay? He came to the dance, caller came to the dance, and he came up to me and he said, you were pretty much using modules that entire first tip that you did. And I, dancers don't come up and say that, all right? So <laughs> so I, I, I did a little double take here, all right? I'm being scoped. Who is this guy? <laughs> and um, I said, no, I was doing some sight calling. But he said, but it seemed like we stayed with our corner quite a bit. And I said, well, I don't know you folks real well, so I want to try to keep you close to a corner relationship so that if the floor begins to have trouble, I can get you out to your corner to an element left very quickly. And he said, oh, okay. And that's one of my little tricks, okay, like a magician sharing how the trick is done. I try to keep them when I'm calling. If I take them away from that corner affiliation, I bring them back quickly to start with so that if something happens, I have a chance to bring everybody back to dancing. Um, I like to say things that are positive over the microphone, things that are fun, have them turn to their corner and say, um, have you seen me dance? Just anything to get them to grin. And I'm sure you can think of a whole lot of other things that callers that turn to your corner and say, now, there's a little poem that you can use for newer dancers that really, because they're out there, their knuckles are white, they're scared to death, and, and they've never maybe danced to another caller except their own teacher, and they don't know what they're doing. And so I will tell them, turn to your corner, we need to set the attitude for the dance. So please turn to your corner and repeat after me. Roses are red. Violets are blue. If I mess up, I'm blaming you. And that usually gets a little giggle and every, oh, okay, and away we go. Now, if I've got that they will allow me to lead them choreographically into some other stuff. So for me, finding out that magic spot where I can start to dig and put the calls out, like Ed was saying, starts with the attitude, the emotion of the dancers that are there. Now, you'll also notice on the handout I write a lot, am I smiling, am I smiling, am I smiling? If I'm smiling on stage, if I walk down the hall and I smile at someone, they're going to smile back. It's facial mimicry, and we do it all the time. So if I, as a caller, I'm standing up there and smiling, and they happen to look up out of their square, and they see me, they smile. It's an automatic thing. Then they're smiling at each other. So you see that I have that on the handout quite a bit. Um, When I first began to call, I had a wonderful caller who came over to my home and helped me with some dancers that I had bribed with food to come over and dance for me so I could practice. And he said, okay, you go ahead and start. So I put on the music, bow to the partner, corner two, and he pulled a needle. Tells you how long ago it's been since I started calling. (laughs) We had vinyl and needles. And he said, what do you know about that square? I had no idea what he was talking about. I knew the people. I danced with them, and, you know, and we had a good time together. And he said, no, what about their ability? Take a look at what's out there. And I was clueless. He said, look at their hand holes. And I thought that was, that was very interesting. Ed mentioned the same thing. He said, you've got one couple in the number one spot. They're not connected at all. They're standing there like two lone soldiers. 
couple number two, they're already reaching out to take their corner's hands. They've got their corners, their, their hands out, expecting to touch hands with corner. What that tells you about those dancers, they may be a little pre-programmed. So you have to watch that. If you call things that are unexpected to their way of thinking and their usual way of dancing, they'll balk. He said, look at couple number three. Couple number three has a hold of each other, but look at their knuckles. They were just like this. They were scared to death. And then he said, look at couple number four. They're standing there. The man has his right hand out. The lady has her left hand palm down. Those dancers know where they're going. They look good. They've assumed the dancer position. They're ready to dance. That was like manna from heaven for me. So there's many subtle things that happen out there on the floor. And I had never translated it to what Ed had said about, look how good they look doing what they think they know how to do. I thought that was brilliant. That's couple number four. The ones that's going out there, the hands are always there and touched and available and ready to rock and roll. And then you have those others that are in there, and you have to be able to allow for that. Little cues over the microphone, touch hands, touch hands. Don't make me come down there. Touch hands, you know, this little things, just to get them to where they, they realize that they have to connect. It's my job to lead them where I want them to go choreographically, not beat them into it, but lead them. And if they aren't touching hands, how can I ask the centers of a line or a wave to do anything? They don't know they're there because they aren't connected. They haven't established it. So I try to make sure that I remind them of that as well. Um, now, I said there are number three. The first couple of sequences are pretty straightforward there. Um, I'm, I'm doing this while I'm calling, all right, while I'm watching that first tip, because I'm watching the entire floor. If I call star through, are all the hands going up at the same time, or is it a ripple drill? Bada bing, bada bing, bada boom. I'm watching for that. I'm watching for the timing. Are they dancing to the timing of the music and my delivery, or are they running like they're quarter horses, or are they moving very, very slowly? for whatever reason. Um, I'm watching that. I'm watching automatic responses from them. I'm watching their conditioned anticipation. If I call spin the top, must I have called a swing through first? If I call spin the top, must I follow it with a right and lift through? I'm watching for that. I'm watching for those conditioned responses. Um, and I'm also watching for how they react to a resolve. When I call Alaman left, do I get some enthusiasm? Or am I getting one of these? <laughs> that usually tells me there's challenge dancers out there. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, but a lot of them do that. They just kind of have the hand. So I'm watching for that as well. I also have found a, a good indicator for me for, for what I can do with the floor is how they react to a right and left grand resolve without the element left first. Some like it. Some don't. So if I get a big whoop when I call, when I have them just walk right into a right and left grand, I know what I've got. But if it's kind of uh, like it didn't feel right, you know, then I know they're going to want those square through threes to an element left. That's what feels right. That's what's going to get their enthusiasm. And i got to throw those out there and please them. But I still might throw a right and left grand get out here and there. Um, resolving to home, some clubs like that. Some clubs don't. I do a lot of res resolution to home as the night gets later because that keeps their energy level up if they're not doing a ton of promenading. If I call a right and left brand, I'd like them to end it at home, okay, or have a, a quick way to get them there. So I'm also watching for that. Now, my tester calls that I like to use, I put several of them there. One of them that I did not write down, and I used it on Saturday, <coughs> excuse me, is the call past the ocean from any other <laughs> arrangement except a zero arrangement. If I call past the ocean and, and everybody is half sashayed, are the girl are, are those two girls gonna make a little mini wave in the middle because they don't know where they're going? Or am I gonna am I gonna have it? Is it is it gonna be smooth or is it gonna be ragged? Is there a lot of grabbing and snatching and, and head spinning and things like this? So that's an excellent call for me to test what's going on. If I'm going to use that, you wanna use a call or a, a different arrangement when it's gonna do the least amount of harm. And by that, I mean if I'm going to call a half sachet past the ocean, it's going to be to a right and left grand. That way, if somebody turns the wrong way, they can turn around really fast because they know who they're supposed to start that right and left grand with. And I haven't left them standing out there feeling foolish or have egg on their face. They can recover 
and start again. And that also gives me an idea of what I'm dealing with out there. Um, I like scoot back as one of my tester calls. Of course, they can do it with the, the standard boys going in and doing the turn through part. How comfortable are they with the girls going in? Ed mentioned doing a mixed gender scoot back. One little trick that I have found that leads to better success with that is if they're in a way of asking them to balance. Because if you ask dancers to, to, to stop thinking linear and think box, it can be a very difficult mental transition for them to make. So if you ask them to balance, it seems to break that, that linear fixation for working only in that wave. And I've found better success at getting them to go in for the scoop back with a boy and a girl. And I'll say, scoop back, boy and a girl. Oh, because sometimes they get in there and think, did I do something wrong? No, I have to cue them to let them know that you're right exactly where I need for you to be. Dixie style to a wave is another one. And somebody, I guess it was Sydney, he, he, was, he was full of questions that day, that Saturday. <laughs> he said, how come the boys never get to lead Dixie style for a wave? Uh-huh. And, and the answer really was there seems to be a flow issue before it where we can get that boy over there because everything that we would do flow-wise from there would, would be from a different arrangement than everybody's comfortable with. Okay, so you have to lead them into it. But if they're not comfortable with Dixie style to an ocean wave, there's that constant courtesy turn on that second on that, that left hand. I can only go so far, you know. Um, and split circulate is another one. Can they split the waves? Usually, usually. But if there's a little bit of a glitch, I'll ask them to do a balance. Again, that seems to break that train of thought and get them to where I can get them to do a split circulate. Um, can they do it from columns? That's my last one that I want to get out there and see. Oh, the ones that just want to do the uh, left-hand pat for the element left and go home? Okay, let's throw you in a column and call split circulate and see your eyes see your eyes light up a little bit, you know. Um, but you have to use these things with a great deal of care. It's like cooking and putting too much salt on the roast. You have to be careful with how you distribute these calls. And uh, this should never be done. These tester calls should not be done at the expense of the entire floor. Your, your ultimate job is not to crash the floor. Your job is to keep them dancing wind in their face and see how far you can take them choreographically. Another recommendation I would give is keep your sequences short. The longer your sequences are, the higher proportionately goes the percentage of the square breaking down. If you use sight calling as your primary method of controlling your choreography, let me tell you, you're way too long-winded. All right? Because it's easy to just be on a roll, man. Away you go. And you don't realize you've called 75 calls in that last sequence. It's so easy to do. So if your resolutions come quicker, the dancers will have a better chance to resolve and get back home and know they did it right. Their confidence in themselves comes up, and their confidence in you comes up. And they will allow you to lead them to bigger and not better, but just different places, different frontiers. Um, if you're going to, uh, I put down there a couple of plus calls that I like to, to throw out there. If I'm calling a tough plus dance, uh, spin chain the gears, or spin chain and exchange the gears without a girl leading, um, that'll, that'll that, yes, it is a challenge. It's a, it's a big one. And can you lead them through it? And can you resolve it quickly enough to where those that kind of went, and had no idea what they were doing, do they get their corner back fairly quickly? Can you get them back home? Peel Off is a call that used to be on our mainstream program. It's now on the Plus program. It's kind of a, it's a double-edged sword call in that dancers are not super comfortable with it, so callers don't call it as often, so dancers never get very good at it, so callers stop calling it. So that's one that I like to, to, to throw out there is Peel Off and see how they do with that. I had a really good reaction with a Peel Off in, um, in Buffalo. They did like a little bit of struggling, but again, they had been taught to touch hands, so whoever was teaching had enforced that reaching out and, and taking hold of a hand. I also like to circulate through the crowd during the tips and see how everybody's doing. Um, if somebody's really dancing well, I like to tell them during one of the, the if they're not dancing the rounds, gee, you guys are so such good dancers. And I really appreciate how nicely you dance. Um, and if it's somebody that's uh, struggling, um, I might go and sit down with them and say, how are you doing tonight? And, you know, how did how you, you feel out there in that last uh, tip? And sometimes they'll tell you. The truth. <laughs> and you can work with that. That's information you can take back. And if that person, well, you know, I've only been dancing four months. Ah, that's, that's knowledge I didn't have before. 
Now I can take that back and, and gear that next tip to, to making that particular dancer feel confident and shine. And then a little bit later on, I can lead him or her a little further than they thought they were capable of doing. So that's basically how I try to read a floor. It's been pretty successful. And yes, I do use modules, and I do uh, I do use some um, crams uh, calling, which is really keeping an eye on the relationship and the sequence of where you are. That helps a lot when it comes to keeping your dancers close to a resolution. So if you lead them out, know where you're leading them. You don't just take off into the desert going, let's go this way, and you don't have a plan, and you don't have any water, and you don't have a compass. You have to know where you're headed. So I do use crams quite a bit to, to keep myself grounded. So as a predominant sight caller, I don't take off like a bull out of a chute and, and have it be a wild, crazy ride. I don't want to do that to them. Okay? Uh, I got That's about all from my portion, unless there's any questions or anything like that. Question. And on the, on the microphone, only because it's being taped. And so yeah, and identify yourself that. first, please. Yes. Lillian Gallagher, and I have to say you gave a wonderful presentation, but one thing you forgot was your name. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> You are, I am, I apologize, you're so right. I am Deborah Carol Jones, I'm from Arlington, Texas. Oh, how, how awful, shame on me. Thank you for reminding me of that. Any other questions? Because, yes, question in the back. Uh, Bill Ackerman, uh, when you said uh, you go out uh, between, during breaks or between tips to talk to people and you find someone who isn't doing well and they tell you the truth, is there anything in particular you say? Do you ever tell them? Anything like, for example, try to get in the, in the front square next tip or something yes, like that. Yes, I do. With, with, so come then. on down here, and I'll, I'll help you. I'll keep an eye on you, and I'll make sure it's better. Okay. Because okay. they want to go to the back of the hall, right? I we found that, that out when my father was in class, and he was not the sharpest knife in the drawer by any stretch of the imagination. And I went out to find out why he was having so much trouble. He danced in the back of the hall. So, yeah, I encourage him to come down. Thank you, Bill. That's a, that's a great suggestion. And not just questions, gang, on this, because I know all three of us, I've got my notebook open here. I'm looking for stuff as well to share. Henry, right over here. Here, Mary, your moderator. I'll give this back to you. Oh. Hi, I'm uh, Henry Grissett from uh, Los Angeles, and I've uh, known Dipper for quite, for quite a while, both Hi. she and Ed. But, uh, yeah, when, I, when you, it, uh, I had a light uh, come on when you were talking about the, the Dixie style from, uh, to an ocean wave with the, with the guys leading. And, uh, I, I've, all, I've found that, you know, as my sight's going, I, you know, I'm certainly not doing sight calling anymore, but what, what I'll do is put them sashayed and, and then, uh, from lines and have them do a right and left through. And you hear the struggles, you know, with the girl turning the boy. If, if they're going to struggle with that, they're definitely not going to get a, get a Dixie style to an ocean wave. So that's, that's one way that you could probably lead them into it. You know, get them doing the, the right and left through from sashayed couples. Now, in the California area where Henry does most of his calling, the predominant dance level there is plus. Because I know some ears pricked up and said, wait a minute, at a mainstream dance, that's not permissible. But where, where Henry and I came from, there basically is not a viable mainstream program. Everything is plus. So to do a half sashayed right and left through would be permissible at that point. Okay? So that's, that's very true. That's a very good point. Come on, don't be shy. Yeah, Miss Bessie. One easy way to do that on the uh, boys leading in Dixie style, starting starting from a starting double pass through with the boys in the middle. And, of course, the, tr the correct terminology is on the double track, boy lead Dixie style. But since plus dancers or mainstream dancers don't know what that is, just say, boys work straight ahead, start a Dixie style. And grab the girl, fling her into the middle. I use off the street words. I don't go technical. They know what fling her into the middle means. But that will never break down. That will never break down. Betsy Gata from New Jersey. One of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit is, especially about now in New Jersey area, some of the clubs that have been teaching lessons have invited their classes to start joining them at the, their regular dances. They want to work the, the class members into the club and make them feel welcome. And the really good clubs will send me a list in advance of what they have been taught. The other clubs, well, it's a little surprise. Either way, with any luck, I get a list. I, I keep extra copies of the mainstream list and, I, and a highlighter, and I mark off what they have. But what I do to start sussing where I can go is they've given me a list of, say, so many calls that I know. I'm going to start not at the last part of the list, but early on, and I'm going to to build a theme and repeat and work around a group of calls. Say the people are pretty close to full mainstream. I'm not going to call past Ferris wheel on the first tip. 
I'm going to build around and call standard stuff, but, you know, square through four, swing through, the boys run, bend the line instead of wheel and deal just for a little variety, reverse flutter wheel. But I'm not going to call beyond Ferris wheel, even though they've had a bunch of the mainstream calls, because I want to build the confidence. I want them to get used to my voice, and I probably am calling a little bit faster than the teacher, whoever the teacher may be, because as teachers, we always baby our classes just a little too much. Then what I'll do is the next tip, say they've had cloverleaf. And so I'll pick cloverleaf, and I'll add that as a, as a theme to the rest of the calls that I've been using and add a couple more calls from, the, say, the basic program that I haven't used yet. So now I've added three or four more calls that are part of a theme. And then I'll pick another one from further out and some others from early on, and we'll theme around them so that by the end of the dance, uh, my goal is to call every single call that the class members have had. But I don't do them all in the first tip. Tom Selner from Maryland. Uh, I was calling. A cl- we have class level dances in our area where we just have a list of calls that we call, and the dancers come and we call. And I, I, had, I was doing the second one of, of the year, and and uh, I, I, at the end of the tip, I hear all this memoring. So I braved myself and up, and, and I went over and asked because I figured I had called something that wasn't supposed to. It turned out it was that their callers had never called circle right. So. <laughs> So, but the, my point really is that sometimes you have to be brave and ask the dancers what's going on, and, and that's my point. Kent Forrester, Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, I have a club in Baltimore that I call for several times a month, and there are two dancers in the club that, as all of us do, they have good nights, they have bad nights, but when they have bad nights, they have really, really bad nights. <laughs> and I've learned to watch their feet during the first tip. If it's going to be a bad night, they are nowhere near walking on the music. But if they're stepping with the music, I know that I can raise the level up a little bit and they'll keep up. So I've actually learned to watch the feet a little more closely. So thank you. That, that's actually a, a large part of what I do when I'm first starting to try and feel out a floor um, is the first couple of sequences are really vanilla and generic for whatever level it is I'm, I'm trying to call. It, it means to me I may well start with a singing call opener or something as, as part of the pattern. And what I'm watching for is the sort of thing that Deborah was talking about. I'm watching for how well do they move? Do they move to the music? Do they hold hands? Uh, are they all moving at the same time? Because uh, that gives you a very quick impression of kind of the, the training level of this floor, or at the, or at the very least their current performance level. Um, and I try and give them very vanilla choreography delivered in a way that makes them listen to me. Because if you're calling to a floor that hasn't heard you call before, your vocal mannerisms and the words that you choose and the way you phrase things are all new to them. So they're learning you know, to, to hear what you're going to say and to expect uh, how you're going to deliver calls. And it's sort of a two-way climatization process going on when, when, you're, when you're doing this. Uh, that was something that I, a realization that I came to when I first started really thinking about this is, yeah, I'm trying to learn what's going on out there on the floor. But I know as a dancer when I'm out there and I hear somebody start to call, I'm subconsciously tuning into what they're saying, how they're saying it. Are they going to say element left or are they going to say left element? Are they going to, are they going to uh, uh, phrase their calls to the music or are they one of the callers that kind of stands back off the beat, just delivers the calls, and you have to figure out, you know, you can't listen to their patter and figure out where you're supposed to be moving. Um, every caller has a different style. And, in fact, when you're working with newer dancers, um, one of the, you know, the big shocks that they get is the first time they dance to another caller other than their teacher. I remember the first time I danced to another caller than my original teacher. Uh, the guy that taught me was a fellow named Al Calhoun. Some of you from Canada would probably uh, know him. Um, very clear, well-articulated caller. Um, every every word out of his mouth was you know absolutely clear. And you had no doubt at all what it was. Didn't have a lot of sort of trash filler and patter. It was mostly calls, but you know very well phrased, sitting in with music. First dance we went to, they'd gotten a bunch of uh, the beginner classes from the area together, four of them. And they packed 14 squares into this little hall about the size of this room. <laughs> and the first other caller that I heard was a guy that I think of as a motor mouth caller. He, he was going all the time. And if you had, you know, 10 beats to execute some sort of a call, he was talking for those whole 10 beats. And so for a dancer who was tuned into somebody who delivered a call, and that was it. You know, we delivered it at the right time on the right phrasing, and then you got to dance the call. Trying to sort all this stuff out, what is the what is just the dribble that I don't have to listen to and what is a command word that I have to react to, that was a huge effort for me. I remember thinking, this guy's a terrible caller. How can anybody dance to him? 
and later he became one of my favorite callers. So, <laughs> so it's just the difference in, in style. Um, so you want to get the dancers used to your style. I mean, styles aren't necessarily so absolutely unique that this needs to be a big deal, but know that the dancers are out there listening, trying to understand how you're going to work. So make that first tip consistent. Uh, you know, try and deliver some consistent phrasing, try and do things on the music, give them some choreography that's got some repetition in it so that they can hear that the same thing happens twice, happens the same way, um, and give them things that they are familiar with so that they're not thinking about what weird choreography is going to be coming at me. Um, they're starting to, they're thinking about smoothing out the actual physical motion of the dancing. Um, something else I do, uh, again, like Deborah, I start watching things before the dance ever starts. I try and, and get there early enough that I can set up my equipment, and um, if I can, I put on what I call interlude music. So uh, that's music that's not square dance music. It's music that you could dance to. It may be line dance kind of music or disco or something that's got a good beat, makes people feel like moving, but it's not necessarily that square dance cadence that uh, would lead them to believe they should square up. <laughs> um, but I watch what the people do with that. And uh, if everybody's just sort of sitting around the outside of the room, you know, nobody's talking to anybody else, and uh, nobody's reacting to this music going on, I know it's going to be a rough night. <laughs> These people did not come in here in a good mood. But on the other hand, if you see people kind of, you know, bopping around to the music, even if they're just sitting down, you know, you see the heads going, and sometimes couples will get up and couple dance to the music, and then you know you got something going. Um, every once in a while it can backfire on you. I, I remember a convention that I was calling at, uh, I'd done this because I was opening the plus hall after the after dinner, and uh, this little guy started dancing out front all by himself. And I mean, he was a dancer, and soon there was a crowd of people gathered around it watching this guy dance. <laughs> and it just happened that, you know, just as this piece finished was when I was supposed to start, and this guy had literally had a crowd of probably a hundred people around him watching him dance. I found out later that he was a professional Broadway dancer which is why everybody wanted to watch him. But um, how do you follow an act like that, right? Now, I'm going to get up on stage call a sport dance after everybody's just been watching this performance. But that's a very unusual uh, thing to happen. So the, the point is, watch what the crowd is doing before you start and decide how much you have to try and shift that mood. Um, if they're already in a good mood, all you have to do is not mess it up. Um, but if they're in one of these, you know, I'm really not sure why I'm here tonight kind of moods, uh, moods, the traffic was terrible and it was a bad day at work and, you know, the kids were irritating, and I really don't want to be here, then you know that that first step's got to be something that wakes them up. And I don't mean wakes them up in the sense of, here's how stupid you are, and I'm going to call all kinds of wild choreography. You want upbeat music. You want uh, a really upbeat delivery. You want to get them moving. You want to get them happy to be moving. You want to get them feeling like, yeah, I can do this stuff. Um, this is going to be a good night. And if you don't do it that first tip, you're toast. So you want to make that reading before you even start calling. And then, as I said, once I start calling, I'm looking for these how well are they dancing uh, markers that have more to do with the physical action of the dancing than how are they reacting to choreography that's going to make them think. Um, then after you've sort of gotten a feeling for how well they're doing, uh, in terms of mechanical dancing action, you can start probing with some of the sorts of tests that Deborah was talking about. Actually, the first thing I probe with is usually forward and back. I'll call heads lead right, circle to a line forward up to the middle and back. Do they do it? Do they do it in the right number of beats of music? And I'll wait. And if you do that a couple of times and they don't start getting the idea that you want them to go forward up to the middle and back and actually take the full number of beats of music to do that because I want them dancing. I don't want them, you know, you don't want them lunging forward and maybe they'll whack hands with the person across from them or something. I want them going up to the middle and back because I want them to do the rest of it in time to the music too. If you can't get them doing something simple like that to the music, then it's pretty hard to get them doing the more complex choreography when you get to it. And I just start slowly building up to things like the Dixie Styles to a wave and how well are they going to react to that kind of thing. Another thing that I'll do fairly early on is I'll test them for um, sashayed positioning. And I'll do that very explicitly. Most dancers don't realize they're sashayed until they get a call that doesn't feel right. And they don't even know why it doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel right. So I'll do something like a right and left through, roll, ladies roll away. And I'll pause. I'll actually let them stop for a beat or two. Because most dancers know that after a roll away, I'm sashayed. Right? That's what it's all about. Um, and I'll let them stand there in their lines for a second, or I'll put them up to the middle and back and let them dance that way and see what they do with it. You know, do they start, as Deborah says, do they start getting kind of 
antsy and like, this isn't right. I can't be over here. I must have done something wrong. Uh, and I'll very quickly get him out of it. You know, I'll do a pass through and fold maybe, which is a quick way out of that kind of thing. Um, but little tests like that, they're not complicated. They're not hard. Um, but they very quickly give you the sense of how that floor is going to dance. Before I forget, um, Don Beck wrote a really nice paper that he called Non-Destructive Testing. That's an engineering concept where, you know, if you're going to test a material to see how strong it is, then there's destructive testing where you actually break it. You say, okay, it broke there. Non-destructive testing is trying to get a sense of how strong it is without actually breaking it. So applied to square dancing, his thought was, what things can you do which will not actually crash the dancers, but which will give you these, these senses? And it's a very good paper. It's up, he's got it up on his website. And in my handouts, which I haven't handed out yet because I didn't think I was starting to talk yet, um, I think on the third page there's... The, the URL where you can see Don's Don's paper. Is that a question for? Yes. Uh, Dan Fowles from Norwich, uh, New York. Um, do you suss the floor when you're calling to a gay club, like you do when you're calling to a straight club? Is it the same, um, or do you look at different things? I mean, because obviously, in a lot of the gay clubs, most people are bidancial. They dance both positions. Um, so if you half sashay them. They, I don't know. I haven't noticed that they react any differently, unless they're just a dancer that really only knows the one position, the leader, the follow. Do you do you look at the floor any differently when you're calling to um, a same-sex club? I do. Um, as you say, the the fact that a, a couple is sashayed on a gay floor is far less of an issue than than it might be on a straight floor. Uh, it's also it's more of an issue for you as a caller because you're less likely to realize that you've got them sashayed, which happens to me all the time. Um, so often on a gay floor, I'll stay away from that kind of stuff, partly because it's not such a big deal for them, but also because I'm trying to make damn sure I don't get the sexes mixed up until I've figured out, you know, what's going on myself, who's dancing what, yeah. Um, but that brings us into another uh, point. I'm, I'm basically trying to fill in some of the, the uh, you know, the comments, uh, fill around the comments that both Ed and, and Deborah have made. Um, we've been talking as if you've shown up on a floor where you don't know anybody and they don't know you. Um, so it's a convention kind of thing or a festival thing that, that you're doing. Um, the fact is, I go through this process every single night for groups that I've called for for 30 years. Well, I haven't been calling for 30 years, but 25 years. Um, every night is different. And I have to, I go through this process that may be somewhat abbreviated, but I know all the people. You know, I'll find out, well, is Henry off his meds tonight? You know, and, um, but... I, I go through it because every night is different. Some nights, days of the moon or whatever the hell it is, you know, they come in and they just aren't going to dance tonight. And other nights, it's like no matter what you call, they're going to do it and they're going to have a good time. So uh, you have to figure out what kind of night you've got. Got a question over here? Phil Rarick, York, Pennsylvania. You talk um, considerably about kind of identifying the lowest common denominator of the floor. What if you discern that you have – um, levels that are very low and various levels that are very high on the same floor. How do you come up with a strategy to deal with that? <laughs> that is a very tough thing, and it's happening more and more often to me anyway. Like I'm finding that um, it's a lot more common than it used to be that the, the delta between the lowest performing people on the floor and the highest performing people on the floor is huge. Uh, and not just because you've got a bunch of supposed hotshot challenge dancers dancing on a mainstream floor. I'm just talking at whatever level you want to pick. Uh, you go in there and you'll get some people who are struggling with the absolute simplest stuff that you might try and deliver for that level, and you've got other people that are, you know, with the simple stuff, and if they don't get something harder, they're, you know, they're feeling a little deprived. Um, what I normally do is I start at the lowest common denominator, like I start really simple, and I start working my way up. I, I, you know, I've got these sorts of tests we've been talking about. Um, and I, I just keep probing for where the breaking point is. And hopefully I can see it coming before they actually break. And by break, I mean, that doesn't mean I'm primarily an advanced and challenge caller. So breaking down a square is not a big deal, right? If the dancers at challenge figure if, if you haven't broken down a square somewhere, you're not calling hard enough. You know, that, a lot of them are looking around like, geez, all the squares are dancing. This guy's calling too easy. So you, you make up your mind for whatever level that you're calling to, a percentage of the floor you're willing to lose. And it's higher at the advanced and challenge than it is at mainstream. I'm not really prepared to lose anybody much at a mainstream floor. But um, 
you probe for the point where you can see them starting to go ragged. You know, they're, they're, now they're starting to scramble. If they were dancing smoothly and now they're starting to get jerky, if you're getting hesitations where before they were just moving right into things, then you can see that now you're stressing them. So now you know where the stress point is. And a lot of what we do as callers is managing stress, right? You don't want to eliminate difficulty. You want to manage difficulty. Because the dancers want to feel, anybody that's doing this form of dance, by that I mean modern Western square dancing, if you think about what's the difference between modern Western square dancing and most of the other dance forms that are around, the difference is the dancers don't know what's coming. Right? Most of the other forms, even traditional square dance, they've learned a dance pattern, they know what's coming. Contras, they've learned a contra dance, they know what's coming. Round dance, they practice this thing for weeks and they know what's coming. So the people that enjoy modern Western square dancing, the reason they enjoy it is this element of surprise. I don't know what's coming, and I can dance it anyway. That, that is what appeals to them. They want a feeling of accomplishment, that they've achieved something, something that wasn't trivial. So you have to find that line. And I don't care whether you're calling basics or whether you're calling C4. It's the same process. There's a line for that floor where if you take them beyond that line, they think, he's calling too hard. He's beating me up. I'm not enjoying this. And if you call too far below that line, they're thinking, when's lunch? You know, they're, they're not engaged anymore. So you've got to find that place where you're stressing them enough that they feel like, oh, this is interesting. This is, this is neat. Isn't it neat that I can do this? I can't believe I'm doing this. You know, isn't that a great feeling? And you can, how many of you have been on dance on floors like that where it's like, I can't believe I'm doing this? And, I mean, it doesn't happen every dance by a long shot, but that's what you're shooting for all the time is you're trying to find that it's a really narrow band. And it's harder and harder these days because we've got more and more floors with these huge disparities in, in dancer capability. Um, but all you can do is try and find that midpoint somewhere where – you may still have some people looking at their watch, and you may have some people that are dying, but you've got the majority of the floor dancing whatever it is that they think they're there to dance. I saw another question back there. Bob, Bob Riggs, Denver, Colorado. Uh, one of the comments was, "Is you're, you're sussing the floor. Your better dancers are sussing you. And which is of, true. Which is true. And the question they're asking is, okay, am I going to be able to go to sleep tonight, or do I need to listen? And I like the – I use the circle right concept very early and because it's a very much of a wake-up call from the point of view of the dancers they go okay there might be something unusual coming out of his mouth and maybe i can stay awake tonight i think that's a huge point associated with the mixed floors that you're talking about the floors that i call to have this huge disparity between the best most capable i don't know what right term is is politically correct but the most capable and the least capable is the terminology i'm using I have struggled with the issue and and how to address it from the floor's perspective. One of the things that I started to do, and I don't do it at every dance, is I will hold a tip, which I call ultimate mainstream, because most of my dances are mainstream. And I'm going to tell them going in, you're going to break down, because we're going to do some unusual things. What's really interesting is they dance better in that tip than they do the entire rest of the night, because they just were notified that they needed to listen. So it's an interesting strategy to address what I refer to as the most capable dancers, providing them something that they can do. But I think the uh, the point to be made is when you're sussing the floor, how do you address the breadth that you have to call to for that night, and how do you address it for any given night? Yeah, there, there's some nights when you just can't get everybody moving together because there's just too wide a range. And not everybody on the floor is going to enjoy the same stuff, so you got to find the middle ground and, and go with that. But there's other nights when, by doing the sorts of things you've, you've been talking about, sort of notifying them in a subtle way, like a circle right, or just something mildly off um, that they need to listen to you. And then you can get them doing things. Um, something I saw, I don't have done it myself, but I put it in my pocket for, for later, was uh, from line facing. They called a right and left through, but ladies in the lead for a double pass through. Flow is great, but for the people that have been used to doing, you know, ladies chain or something out of that. <laughs> um, but it you know, that's the sort of thing where it's not hard. All you have to do is listen to what you said, and and, uh, and they go. But there's lots of little gimmicks like that. that uh, and the way you find them out is by watching other callers. Betsy? Thank you, Pam. Betsy got it again. A couple of points. Barry mentioned about repetition. And one of the things that there's a caller in our area, what he does is he calls a calls a call and, the, and say two out of five squares 
do something exciting and creative as opposed to what he actually called, um, he kind of immediately starts workshopping or talking people through the call. But maybe they just weren't listening. So my rule, uh, my rule personally is a rule of three. I use it the first time if things don't work well. Then I use it a second time and I give some helper words. I use it a third time and give some helper words. If I don't have success at that point in time with that idea, there are two possibilities I need to do. One is to workshop the call and two is to drop it for now. But then I have sussed my floor and know that that's where I'm going. There's another factor. Also, when you're talking about the people who are really good, comfortable dancers as opposed to the folks who are a little more nervous and creative, uh, my dancers never make mistakes. They are creative. But anyway, once you have figured out who those key dancers are that you would be keying on, if the floor mixes well, then what you can do, like, say for I find we have the courtesy turn problem in Dixie style to a wave. But if I can put the guy who's having trouble in Dixie style to wave with a lady across from him who is really a good, confident dancer, then she will help guide him into the position without and not allow him to make the mistake. And so then I'm actually kind of letting some of the more experienced dancers do the work for me that I would have to do in a workshop uh, just because she's going to just go and take his hand and swing him into the middle because that's what she expects. And he's not going to get away with courtesy turning her. So if you can get them to mix, then you have to pay attention to who's working with who for what you want to do and mix the dancers for your choreography, which is like a second or third level of sussing your floor. Yeah, some of these, these things uh, can actually be used as uh, they become a theme for the, for the evening. Um, I mean, one of the things that I use as a test is centers in. So you're all used to double pass through, put centers in, cast off three quarters. How many times have you heard that? Well, what if you don't cast off three quarters? So I'll call a double pass through, put centers in, and I'll wait. And, of course, you'll get about three quarters of the floor usually doing the cast off three quarters. Say, don't get ahead of me. You know, make a joke out of it, but then start working on it. That, you know, I'll call centers in again and wait until I've got the whole floor to the point where they'll wait to hear what's coming next, and then I'll do something else. Of course, since you've been waiting, you can do just about anything out of that line facing out because body flow doesn't matter anymore. But that gets them, that gets them listening to you. Um, and then you can start doing centers in from weird places, you know, do it from any chain setup instead of beginning the whole pass through setup. Uh, one call that I used to use as a test, and I don't anymore, is zoom. And the reason I don't anymore is because most floors can't zoom at all. If you do it from anywhere except a zero tag, like a beginning double pass through, they can't do it. If you call a double pass through and zoom, you'll lose most of the floor. Call it out of columns, you'll guarantee to lose all of the floor. You try doing an end zoom or a center zoom. I mean, that is a challenge as far as they're concerned. But in years past, now I'm, I started as a challenge and advanced and challenge caller, and I've only really been calling mainstream stuff since about, what, 98, I guess I started. When I, they, I started getting booked at festivals and stuff where they said, what do you mean you can't call mainstream? So I had to, you know, get my act together. So I haven't been calling it that long. But when I first started calling mainstream and plus at conventions, Zoom was something they could do. Now they can't. So I don't know where that call went. And I've discovered there's other calls that has sort of, they come and they go. Swing and mix. About five years ago, you couldn't find an advanced floor that could do swing and mix to save your life. But now they can again. So I don't know what's going on with this stuff. You know. Good question. The uh, excellent mainstream leveler to see how well the dancers know the calls, or have, especially how long they've been dancing, is Do Paso. And John uses that every single dance. He will have them circle left and say, Busted up Do Paso. And. Um, and then watch the mess that happens. <laughs> and uh, I love it as a dancing the girl's part at Do Paso because it's, the flow is perfect for me. I'm going right in that direction. My partner's right there. And it's the man who has to, to make the adjustment and for turn change, back yeah. towards partner, which is, yeah, which is a nice change of pace. So um, I appreciate it. But just calling it cold from a circle, boy, that will give you a read on the floor real quick. And it's just mainstream call, basic call, been around for a long, long time. Yeah, wheel around is another one that will do that. <laughs> Are the, I'm not sure how much more I have to say. Are there any more questions? Do you Ed, have a couple of things? Um, what, when did do we go to 12 or to 12.15? Lunch starts at 12.15. I'm not sure. So we've got 15 more minutes. Is it their hour and a half sessions? Okay. Well, Tom Sellner from Maryland. I, I sort of walked the lines that you were talking about. With a, I, I go around exactly what Barry was talking about. Um, what, I, what I do is when I see the floor stressed, okay, or are they breaking down, 
what I will do, even if I have to go back to circle left, is I want to get their feet moving back in time to the music. Because if I can get them moving back in with the music, then I have a chance of doing whatever I want to do. So if I am, or if they're already stressed, and then I call something really harder after that, I have just killed my success level like anything. But if I can have them moving, and also the other thing I do is if I call something that doesn't really flow from one call to the other and it's difficult, I'm guaranteeing I'm losing because I'm going to lose some of my four. Even the good dancers are going to go down because I got them flowing in a different direction than I liked than they wanted to be. And it may be that they're just used to going this way, and I made them go this way, and then I called something even simple, and they went down because I didn't flow them into it. So I really, I really believe in, and I found even in class level, when I did class level series, if I could get the dancers moving in the direction I want to do, they may not even know the call, but half the time with a little help, they got through it. And I thought that very good. And then the comment about when you have different levels, I heard a, this is not me originally. I, I won't claim I, did, I said this. But somebody said once, once, it doesn't matter what you have on the floor, but every dancer in that floor has to have a Christmas present. So sometime during the night, you have to give that dancer a Christmas present that they do and they really feel good. If you do that, you're going to have a successful dance, even if it's the only one thing that they do that night. Thank you. I had a couple of things I wanted to follow up with uh, just on what Barry and, and um, Deborah Carroll said. First of all, in the Do Pass O, um, I find great success with it. I call it out of facing lines. But if I just called it out of facing lines cold, they'd die. But I get them in facing lines, and I say, look down on the floor, remember these footprints. Do pass O, partner left, go to the corner, turn by the right, no problem, back to partner, courtesy turn, finish in those footprints I told you, remember? They do it perfect. Do, whatever, do it as a guest caller all the time, they have no problem. And from the circle left, as long as I cue it, they'll do it. If I say circle left and do pass O, they're all over the place. But if I say circle left, partner left, as soon as I say partner, they know where their partner is, they go to that. Um, Deborah mentioned peel off. That's another good call. As a test call, I like to use that. And the question is, do, from a completed double pass through position, do the trailing dancers notice step forward on a peel off, or do they just turn around in place? If they notice step forward, they're good again. They're good dancers. If they just turn around in place and spin like a little top, something else. Um, never mentioned about getting people happy, uh, have, having them laughing. I like to have people laugh, and I, I try to throw in comments that will get people laughing, even if they've broken down. I'll say, on a singing call, head square through four sides, laugh at the heads. Whole floor laughs. Uh, bottom of the partner, step on your corner. You know, everybody's stepping and hitting, and it's just getting people getting people to laugh. Um, totally agree with what Deborah said about smile. You have to smile all the time, but you have to keep yourself happy. And how do you keep yourself happy at a dance? What I've found, and I learned this real early, always underestimate what the people can do. I go into a dance, and I expect nothing. Therefore, if I get a little sliver, I'm happy. But if I go into that dance expecting a whole bunch of stuff and now they don't, don't do it, I'm depressed the whole night. So to keep myself happy, I expect nothing, and then, then I'm happy. On the right and left, grand resolves. And, and um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, never mentioned that. I found that mainstream plus dancers don't like right and left grand resolves without the left out of man and without the resolve, and the resolve at home. It's like you're cheating me out of the left out of man. You're supposed to do a left out of man. What's the matter with you? So I will do two or three right and walk right into a right and left grands during the course of a night to satisfy those particular people, like Tom was saying, that are looking for that and will appreciate that. And I'll do a couple at-home resolves to satisfy the people that are looking for that. But I won't do it all night. I'll do it very little because it means you, plus they aren't looking for it. Now, at Advance and Challenge, they're looking for that. So I'll do a, a lot more of that. Um, where it, the subject came up on, on length of sequences. My rule of thumb on a sequence is 45 seconds. I don't care where it's module or site calling. I want 45, no longer than 45 seconds. Why? Because I want to give the floor as many carrots as I can. And if my sequences are too long, maybe I'm only going to give them four or five carrots of a left out of man. But if I have 45 second or even 30 second sequences, now I give them a lot of left out of mans all the time, positive reinforcement. Deborah mentioned about the, um, uh, the mix X scoot back, and she does the, uh, the rock forward and back, which is, which is good. And that caused me to think about something that you see written in, in notes or material. And this is guaranteed to break a floor down, even though it's nothing. And the call is from normal parallel waves. And uh, parallel waves, uh, let's say they can do a, um, um, a mixed-sex scoot back. We, we assume that. So from normal parallel waves, you call scoot back and then recycle. 
It's a killer. Why? Because the scoot back has them looking north-south, and the recycle has them instantly change their mindset to east-west, and most people can't do that. And yet you see this written up. You see this written up. Um, they were mentioned about circulating through the crowd. I love to do this and congratulate people that are doing stuff right where other people aren't. I will call dose to dose no more than two times a night because I don't like to call because I feel it's a double reversal of body flow. But I will call it just to see how many people are going to do this call right. And usually 95% of them don't do it right. But if I see somebody that is, I will go down on the floor and personally congratulate them after my tip. And that just boosts me right up in their eyes. Gee, he noticed me to calling, calling the dance. Um, the gentleman from Maryland talked about, um, are the dancers dancing to the music or not? To me, most dancers aren't. To me, we don't have square dance. Our activity is no longer square dancing. It's square walk. I am, I am amazed when I go into a hall and people are dancing to the music. I just don't see this. In fact, it is so rare for me to see a whole four dancing to the music that I will, over the mic, congratulate them for doing so well. And, of course, they just beam at this. And I only do this if they are actually dancing to the music. But it's very rare, very rare that I see a whole four dancing to the music. Now, if isolated people are doing it, then I'll get down to the floor between, uh, between the tips and, um, and do that. Uh, but one way you can get people to – very mentioned about the people sitting around and looking glum before the dance starts. If you have upbeat patter music, you can lift this floor right off the ground. You can have them dancing on, a, on a, like a hydrofoil, three inches of air underneath their feet. But you've got to use the right music, and you've got to build it with the volume, and then you've got to control it. And I, I use a couple records like that during the course of the night where even if it's a disaster floor, they're going to enjoy it just because of the music. And if I call nothing, they don't care just because they're really feeling the music. Okay, those are the things. Just to add to what Ed was saying about congratulating the dancers on dancing to the music or doing something nicely, it also is a good thing if it's not your group. If you're going to congratulate the dancers over the microphone for something they're doing well, uh, compliment their caller and say whoever taught you taught you well. And if that caller is there, oh, my gosh. And, and, and it, they will go back and tell their caller, Ed Foote said, you know, that, that we danced really well and it was because we were taught well. And that really helps. That pa- passes a little bit of that that positive reinforcement back to the source and I think that's that's good business there's, a, there's another thing I do too we know that people don't square up fast you know you're up there begging the people to square up but every once in a while you find a club that'll square up really fast and when I see this boom I congratulate them right over the mic there's a club in California. I even wrote them up in my article in American Square Dance Magazine about how fast they squared up. And they now have this reputation. Every time I show up, they say, we've we got to live up to what Ed Foote wrote about us. And they race out on the floor. It's on. So if, some, if a group will square up quick, then I will congratulate them over the mic for that. <laughs> Down at the bottom, it says, I said square up. <laughs> Uh, Steve Anderson from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, it sounds to me like not only are you checking the floor when you first square up in the evening and then you've got your music that you're talking about and stuff like that, but throughout the night you're also checking the floor because some of your dancers will be, you know, um, the elderly will be dropping out and not dancing and stuff. And so, um, you know, the type of music that you're talking about, you know, let's get them going first and we're, you know, rocking and rolling and everything. And then, you know, you kind of taper off. So you're also talking about your whole program throughout maybe the whole evening kind of thing for your two hours if you're doing dancing for a couple hours. And then you want to come back after like the uh, mid-break or something and then hit them again with this really tough music and everything. Are you, I mean, are you constantly, you're saying that you're um, checking the floor all the time for that kind of stuff. And if you feel like, well, I got mixed in, I got the kinds of like the patty cake because, you know, they're advanced dancers and stuff. Do you ever do any other type of stuff that would mix them up say okay now I want y'all to scramble and find a new square uh you know do different things that'll um excite the floor again and get, bring that level back up again if you feel like they're kind of like losing them or something yeah, that's a good point that the even though if you figure you've got a good reading on the first tip second tip could be a whole different animal you know you've got a different mix on the floor and uh if you're on number systems which are in some places sometimes the numbers 
put bad combinations of people together, and you wind up, you know, with all the beginners in one place, maybe, and and so you got a square that can do nothing. You got another square over here that's just eating everything up. So um, you have to every tip you have to do a little bit of this. I also find um, a lot of my groups are starting to get on uh, in age, and um, I'm seeing a real fatigue factor. So after they've danced for an hour, an hour and a quarter, you know, about that point in the evening, suddenly they can't do anything in there anymore. Like their brains have just switched off, and you need to go somewhere else. To me, that's the time for, for making absolutely certain your sequences are short and your resolutions are at home. To save that that energy. I know just per, even personally, I don't have the stamina that I used to have. And so I try to, to work that, and that's reading, again, sussing what they're able to handle at a point in time. And that's just a general game plan that I use as the evening goes on. I, I have more resolves at home. Can any of you speak to tempo as part of sussing? Well, um, the first tip, my investigatory tip, um, I'll pick music that has a, a solid but not really fast tempo. I don't want the dancers to feel that they're being harried or, or pressed. Um, I want something that I find easy to work with. So I'm not going to pick music that has um, a lot of funny key changes in it or something like that or, or a rhythm that I find difficult to fit my normal vocal cadences into. Um, I want something that I feel really comfortable with so I can concentrate on what's going on on the floor and not concentrate on trying to fit what I'm doing to some strange phrasing in the music. Um, and I think that my experience has been that the, what the dancers want or what works the best is music that has that solid boom chuck kind of beat. Um, it's it's easily there. Like, they can hear it. It's not that they're straining to figure out what's going on, but it's not intrusive. So, in other words, they're listening to me. They're not listening to the music. Um, I, I don't want them listening to the, you know, this great piece of music going on in the background while you're trying to, f you know, get them dancing smoothly to your voice. I don't like to start a dance with a super fast tempo. Um, one of the things I love about doing my music digitally is if I have a piece of pattern music that starts and it just feels too fast to me, I can hit the E key and bring it down just a tiny bit. It isn't like we go to this tempo. It's just a short, just a tiny, tiny little adjustment. Um, if you're wondering if you have your music set too fast, one of the things that you can do is stand up at the, um, I'll come out here and, and you want to keep time to the music and you're raising your, um, oh, good catch, Barry. Um, you're raising your feet like this. You're doing this to the music. And if you find that your shins begin, the muscles in your shins begin to cause you a little discomfort, you probably have your tempo a little fast. Okay? So if you set your tempo, make sure that you're doing this and, uh, it will be a good indicator. But I don't like to do it too quickly. I, I like to keep a, a more even, a little bit more even tempo because you can you can have exciting music, but that doesn't have to necessarily mean that that music is faster. It's just more interesting. As Tom Selner, when I start a dance, I all, the first thing I do is move the people's feet, even if I have to call circle left at a dance, and and I don't do anything else much until I can see the floor is moving to music because I know my success is going to be minimum until I see it. We have a lot of dancing. I get a lot of dances. I see it. The caller is calling, and the dancers are not dancing to him. They're just moving around. And his success level is going to be minimum. But if I can get my dancer to move in time to the music and keep it, and then every time they struggle, come back to that, I will have much greater success. I may not have everything I want, but I'll get that success. And I think that that's a problem we really have. We really need to get our dancers back dancing dancing to music. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. We're just about uh, out of time, and I'd like to thank my uh, panelist, Ed Foote.